The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to Mercy Medical Center's live webinar. If your computer doesn't have speakers and you wish to access the webinar toll-free, click on the additional numbers link under audio. Today we'll be discussing prediabetes with Jane Shaw, nurse educator, and Denise Shear, dietitian at Jocelyn Diabetes Center. After their discussion, they'll take questions from our audience. To submit your questions anytime during the discussion, go to the window in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and type in your question. If you don't see the screen, click on the orange box with white arrow. Your questions will be anonymous, completely confidential. So let's get started. Thanks. I'm Jane. I'm one of the nurse educators out at Jocelyn Diabetes Center. We're glad to be here today to answer some of your questions about prediabetes. You can see that we have a lot of material to cover today, and we're hoping that um, we can get you informed and learn more about prediabetes that we've been hearing so much about. I think before we talk about prediabetes, it would be a good idea to clarify exactly what kind of diabetes we're talking about. So on your screen, you can see there's two main types of diabetes that we usually concern ourselves with. Type 1, formerly known as juvenile diabetes, really has one defect. They just don't make insulin. It's an autoimmune disorder in which the immune system attacks the cells that make pancreas. This is only about 10% of all the people with diabetes. So usually we see type 1 in young children. Type 2, however, can occur in children or adults, um, but it really has two defects. There's probably more than that, but we're going to talk about two main defects today. And one of them is insulin resistance. Your body just does not use insulin as well as it should. And there's a decreased insulin production. So they're different in um, how they start. They're different in how they're treated. Um, and yet they have a lot of similarities as well. Over 90% of the people who have diabetes actually have type 2. So when we're talking about um, prediabetes, we're talking about a condition in which the blood sugar is higher than normal, but yet not high enough for a diagnosis of diabetes. We're talking about pre-type 2 diabetes. It used to be called impaired fasting glucose or glucose intolerance. Um, now we're really concentrating on the term at risk for diabetes. So before we talk about um, diabetes, I also want to throw in here and talk a little bit about metabolic syndrome because what's the difference? What does it mean? Well, metabolic syndrome is really a collection of conditions that all put you at increased risk for diabetes. So you would be considered to have metabolic syndrome if you have three of the following um, conditions. I think it's important that whether you have the syndrome or not, it's necessary to treat each of the conditions individually. So you can see that prediabetes, that fasting blood sugar greater than 100, um, is only one part of metabolic syndrome. Um, each of these parts needs to be treated separately um, in addition to grouping them together for treatment. So before we talk about what diabetes is, I have a little video here to help you understand how insulin works in our body. When you eat, your body breaks down food into sugar. Sugar is used as a source of energy by your body. Sugar travels through the bloodstream to reach all the cells in your body. Sensing that you have eaten, your pancreas releases insulin. Insulin takes the sugar from the blood into your body's cells to be used for energy. This energy supports all of your body's functions needed to stay alive. The next clip that I'm going to show you actually describes what happens in type 2 diabetes. So this is where the defects come in of type 2. 
When people have diabetes, their body does not make any or enough insulin. Without insulin, your body can't use food properly. That is, sugar cannot enter your cells and be used for energy. As a result, sugar builds up in the blood. Often the pancreas makes some insulin, but the body cannot use it well. This is called insulin resistance. If your body cannot use insulin, sugar cannot enter your cells and be used for energy. Again, sugar builds up in your blood. To help the sugar enter the cells, the pancreas tries to make more insulin. For some reason, as if the pancreas gets tired, insulin production eventually slows down. Most people with type 2 diabetes have insulin resistance and defective insulin secretion. That is, their body cannot properly use the insulin it makes, and their body does not make enough insulin. Okay, so we just saw that insulin is necessary for glucose control, and in some people, insulin resistance begins to build up. Denise is going to talk to you more about insulin resistance in just a minute. And eventually, the body starts to make less insulin. So it's during this stage of not making quite enough insulin when the blood sugar first starts to go up that we're talking about prediabetes. So is that really a problem? Well, yeah, it is, because we know that unless you treat this condition of prediabetes, that most people will develop type 2 diabetes within 10 years. So it's a warning sign that we need to do something to prevent diabetes from occurring. In addition to that, I think it's really important to know that prediabetes in and of itself actually doubles the risk of death due to heart attack. So even before your blood sugars are high, you still have increased risk for heart disease, even with prediabetes. So it's estimated that about one in four adults over the age of 20 had prediabetes in 2007. We we're really talking about an epidemic of type 2 diabetes in this country. The CDC says that one out of three babies born in the year 2000 will have diabetes in its lifetime if we keep going at the rate we're going. So we really, really need to, practice, to focus on the prevention of diabetes, and that's why we're here today. So who gets it? Well, the obvious first risk factors for prediabetes are obesity and physical inactivity, because those two factors greatly increase insulin resistance. Those are things that we can do something about. We can lose weight and we can be more active. Unfortunately, we can't change our family history. But if you have a family history of diabetes, you are more at risk for both prediabetes and then therefore diabetes. Um, certain ethnic backgrounds are at higher risk. Giving birth to a, a large baby, a nine pound baby or more, or if you had gestational diabetes during your pregnancy, you are at higher risk for diabetes and prediabetes. Having high blood pressure, having high HDL triglyceride levels, excuse me, low HDL, high tri triglyceride levels. Having a condition called PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. Smoking actually increases insulin resistance. So it's not only lung disease, it's for a blood vessel disease like diabetes as well. Having a history of cardiovascular disease or being over the age of 45. So some of these things we can change. Some of them we can't, some of them we don't want to. Uh, most of us want to keep going after the age of 45. So who should get tested? If you're at risk, the American Diabetes Association says that if you're overweight, overweight and have one or more other risk factors, um, you should be tested at any age as an adult. If you're over 45, even without additional risk factors, you should be tested. It recommends that if those tests are normal, that testing should re be repeated at least every three years. So what tests are we going to do? Well, there's three tests right now that are approved for use for the um, diagnosis of prediabetes or diabetes. And I have them listed on the screen. The first one is an A1C. The next one is a fasting plasma glucose or a, a fasting blood sugar and an oral glucose tolerance test. The A1C is a blood test that's actually measuring your blood sugar over the last three months. 
Um, an A1C of 5.7% or less is considered normal, not at risk, not diabetes. Um, Prediabetes is if your A1C falls between 5.7 and 6.4. Anything 6.5 or above is diagnostic for diabetes. So you can see it's sort of a continuum. Um, there's no um, now you have it, now you don't. It's really a gradual uh, continuum of numbers there. The fasting blood sugar, less than 100 is considered normal. If it's above 126, it's diabetes. So anywhere in the middle of that is considered prediabetes. The glucose tolerance test can be done, but it's not done as much because it takes too much time and it's a little bit more expensive. But a, fa a blood sugar, no matter what you've had to eat, um, it, less than 140 is considered normal. Anything over 200 would be considered diabetes, and prediabetes or risk for diabetes in, is in the middle of that. So if you are at risk for it, if you have it, if you've been diagnosed, isn't there a pill we could take for it? Well, currently there's no drug that's approved by the FDA for treating either insulin resistance, prediabetes, or for the prevention of type 2. However, the American Diabetes Association has recommended that metformin should be used for those people who are at very high risk for developing diabetes as long as they're less than 60 years of age. So it's really um, rather interesting. The American Diabetes has usually been fairly conservative in their recommendations, and they're actually recommending a drug that's not really intended for that purpose. Metformin um, is used very effectively for those people with diabetes, and now we are seeing it used uh, for prediabetes as well. So if, we, if you're on metformin, if you, what else can you do? And I think that's where Denise Shear is going to come in and talk to you more about the other treatments for prevention of diabetes or for prediabetes. Hi, um, I'm Denise Shear, and I'm a dietitian and certified diabetes educator at the Joslin Diabetes Center. And I'm going to start off my part of the talk um, kind of continuing what Jane was talking about as far as the risk factors for um, having prediabetes. And one of the things she talked about that we can have some control over is weight and activity. And they actually did a big research study called the Diabetes Prevention Program <clears throat> that looked to see if diet and exercise or a medication could delay or prevent type 2 diabetes. And this was actually done on people with prediabetes. And what they found out in this study is that millions of high-risk people can use diet and exercise to avoid or delay type 2 diabetes. They found that if people lost a modest amount of weight, maybe 10, 20 pounds, and exercised for about 150 minutes a week, which is 30 minutes, five days a week, then they reduced their risk of developing type 2 diabetes by almost 60%. So the bottom line here is that diet and exercise sharply reduce the chances of a person with prediabetes developing type 2 diabetes. Now the cartoon I'm going to show you next shows that as far as exercise goes, you could install a rope system like this one and try to get to your refrigerator that way. But I have some other suggestions for exercise that might be a little bit more practical. And um, when we looked at some of those slides as far as how um, diabetes happens, we saw that when the glucose can get into the cells, that, that starts to raise your blood glucose. What exercise does is kind of open the cells and lets the glucose go in. And this is just some ideas on what you can do to increase your activity. They recommended um, in the study we just talked about that 30 minutes of activity five days a week would be really helpful. And you don't have to do that all that 30 minutes at one time. You can break that up. Um, you probably don't want to do less than 10 minutes. That gets to be too little amount at one time. So maybe three 10-minute sessions a day or two 15-minute sessions. And what that does for you is if you plan to do all the 30 minutes at one time, sometimes something comes up, say you plan to do in the evening and your friend comes over, you don't get it done. So if you break it up into those smaller segments, at least you get part of it done during a, any given day. And then for most people, um, walking is probably the best activity. And um, you know what we find is wearing a pedometer, something that counts your steps, can be really, really helpful. The goal is to get about um, 10,000 steps a day to get up to that. What we find is that most people on the average probably get about 5,000 steps a day. So the thing to do is to put a pedometer on, clip that on your waist, and 
see how many steps you typically get, and then see ways, kind of find ways that you can figure out to increase your activity throughout the day. There's so many modern conveniences now. Um, we have things that wash our clothes, do our dishes. We don't have to get up to turn the TV to a different station. And so what you want to think is, how can I incorporate activity just throughout my day? And a lot of the practical ideas you might have heard before are things like using the stairs instead of the elevator, um, parking farther away, taking a walk at your work breaks, anything like that, doing yard work can be very helpful. So it um, doesn't take a lot of change, but just a few small changes in your in your day-to-day -day activity can be really helpful. Other types of exercise are also important. Um, being flexible is important. And a good time to do some stretching is after you've done a little bit of walking, um, after you've done a little bit of cardio like that. And then your muscles become warm and easier and more flexible. And so you can actually get more benefit out of that, those flexibility exercises. And you want to be stretching your head and neck all the way down to your calves and ankles when you, ex when you do flexibility exercises. And then as far as muscle building, that's something you probably want to do at least two to three times per week. Um, muscles need time to heal, so you want to do muscle strengthening and then take a day off for those muscles to rebuild. Some examples of, of muscle exercises would be sit-ups, push-ups, um, hand weights that you, you use at home or weight machines at an exercise facility, and then things like exercise balls or exercise bands. Now, these ideas are all really good, but sometimes you a person likes a little bit more guidance. And one of the resources that we have here at Mercy is the Mercy Fitness Center. It's a really comfortable place to go, and um, if you'd like to get more information on exercise, they offer a lot of things such as um, sports and personal training, wellness coaching. You can get massage therapy and large variety of, of exercise classes to fit any needs. This picture here is actually showing um, something from a book called The Hungry Planet, What the World Eats. And it really kind of makes you see what kind of society and what, what kind of um, environment we live in compared to people in other countries. This is a, a um, small village in Bhutan called the Shingki Village. And there's actually 13 people, I think, in this picture. I think I got them all counted. And their average um, expenditure on food, the average cost of food for them per week is only $5.03. A typical recipe for them might be mushrooms, cheese, pork, those kinds of things. But what I see in the picture here is really a lot of rice and vegetables. So that shows you them. Then we're going to move to an American family. The picture's a lot different here. Um, this is a family of four from North Carolina. And their average expenditure is $341.98. And you see there's a lot more food here. Things are a lot more plentiful for this, this small family. And what one of the things they learned in, in looking at the different families in this book is that our diet is determined by things we can't always control, um, poverty, conflict within a country, just where we live in the world and what's available to us. And if people have more food to eat, uh, they often just eat more foods that aren't nutritious and therefore their health suffers rather than actually benefits in some cases. So just kind of being aware of that I think is a good thing and, and can maybe change some of the habits that we have day to day. This next cartoon shows that you know there's a lot of fad diets out there. Um, this lady has obviously tried a shake. She, and the doctor says, the only diet shake I recommend is the shake your booty makes when you exercise. Um, so I don't recommend fad diets. Um, they tend to not work long term. They don't lead to lifestyle changes that help to decrease weight and, and change your activity levels. And they really can be just a waste of money for most people and even sometimes dangerous. What do we recommend? Well, it really comes down to very simple things. Um, you want to have natural, unprocessed foods that don't have a whole bunch of sugar, fat, and salt added. Um, a great example is just plain oatmeal. When you're trying to get back to nature with your foods, if you eat things like oatmeal that doesn't have anything added, that's a good example of a food. Now, if you go to the grocery store, they have a lot of things they put oatmeal into and, and maybe aren't as healthy. For example, little packets of oatmeal where they've added flavoring, so they've added sugar, a lot of sugar to those things and salt in a lot of cases. Even less healthy might be some of the granola bars, like um, the ones that are coated with chocolate and then they have fat, sugar, and salt all added into them. And then there's not nearly as much fiber because a lot of the oatmeal is replaced by other things. Going kind of down some of the, the types of foods on this list that we have, fruits and vegetables are probably the most ignored foods in our country. Um, 
what we recommend is people get at least two fruits and three vegetables a day. But when you talk to people, probably most people are lucky to get one of each, um, if any, in a typical day. So what you want to do with fruits and vegetables is avoid the ones with the heavy syrup and sauces and just go to your basic things like green beans, tomatoes, carrots, dark leafy lettuce, broccoli, and cauliflower. The whole grains um, are the way to go when you're talking about um, the bread-like foods. So what I mean by that is getting things like brown rice, whole grain bread, whole grain cereals, um, things like bran flakes and shredded wheat and the oatmeal that we just talked about. And then with the beans, those are another really ignored group, but they're a really good, the dried beans are a really good source of protein. As far as meats, you want to go for the lean meats like um, pork tenderloin and sirloin and then lean fish and um, chicken are always a good option. As the dairy products, skim milk, non-fat yogurt, um, low-fat cheeses, like cheeses with three grams of fat or less are, are the kind to go with. As, and as far as oils, you want the liquid oils. Olive, canola, and safflower oil are really good examples there. The water and calorie-free diet drinks are the best things, um, obviously, compared to your regular sodas, which you can get so many extra calories from regular sodas. Um, just even drinking a couple of those a day can bring you way over what the calories that you want to get per day are. And then cutting back on the high-calorie snack foods and desserts. And just an example there is when you go to Dairy Queen, you know, a lot of people love the blizzards, and, and I'm right with you. I like them too. But what you find is a, they add up a lot of calories really fast that you're not planning on. For example, um, a medium cookie dough blizzard at Dairy Queen has 1,010 calories. And if you look at most men and women, to manage weight, probably want to get about 14 to 1800 calories a day. You know that's just just cutting into your your um, day so much. So just doing something like changing from a blizzard to a small cone at the Dairy Queen can help because a small cone has more like 240 calories and is much easier to add into your day. Some ideas on snacks um, that might be good, maybe about one to 200 calories, would be having a container of light yogurt, fresh fruit. A, cup, a fourth cup of nuts, which is about a handful or a palm size. And some of the healthier granola bars might be good. Um, Kashi makes some, Fiber One makes some. But there's a lot of really good snacks out there that just tend to kind of get left behind. This is showing a real simple method for improving what you eat day to day. And you don't have to count anything. You don't have to really think about it as long as you kind of divide up your plate visually like you see here. So you take a small lunch size plate, not so much a dinner plate, and divide that in half and put half, half of it being just all vegetables. And then and that could be hot vegetables, cold vegetables, but more of the vegetables we talked about earlier in, in the previous slide. And then the other half of the plate you divide in half again. And fourth of that, you want to be something that would be like a starch type food, maybe um, whole grain bread, potatoes, brown rice, something like that. And then the other fourth would be where your leaner meats would be. You still have plenty of calories in available for some fruit on the side and a glass of milk or some yogurt. And then another way you can kind of think of this plate at breakfast is you're not going to be eating the same foods, but you could keep half of your plate at breakfast being whole grains like toast or oatmeal, or you might have a bowl of cereal in that half. And then a fourth of it being fruit. And then another fourth of it could be some protein, maybe not quite as big of a portion as you do at lunch or dinner, but an egg or some peanut butter or something like that. So this can be used at any meal and just a quick way to, to healthen things up. I do want to look a little bit at the food label. They can, if you look at them too closely, they can be really overwhelming and confusing. So what we're going to do today is just look at three things on this label. And the first thing you always want to check is the serving size. If you have a really big you know, um, serving size compared to what's on the label, that's something that you just want to have. It's a red flag. So, the serving size on the label might not be what you eat, so be aware of what the label says for that. And in this case, it's a half a cup. The second thing we're going to look at is the calories that are just below the amount where it says amount per serving. They list the calories in bold print, and there's 230 calories in this food. And what you want to kind of think about is, how would this food fit into my calorie needs for the whole day? For women, probably a general guide for calories might be 1,500 per day for just good weight maintenance and, and good health, and for men, 1,800. Now, I want to point out that this calorie level varies so much. It's just a general guide. It varies by height, weight, age, activity, and um, just everybody's a little bit different. So keep that in mind. But let's look at how this food would fit in for a, a woman who would want to take in about 1,500 calories. 230 calories really wouldn't be that bad. Um, that would be maybe half of what she'd want to have for a meal. 
So that would be workable. For a snack, you might want to get more like 100 to 200 calories, and there it's, it's a little bit on the high side for a snack. Third thing I want to look at is total carbohydrates. And keep in mind that whatever the calories are listed, that's for that serving size of one half, a cup, one half cup at the top. And the same is true for the carbohydrates. So when it says 32 grams of carbohydrate, that's in a half a cup of this food. For carbohydrates, a general guide, again, for some people might be 45 to 60 grams per meal. Well, this food has 32 grams of carbohydrates, so it's a good portion of what you'd have, maybe a two-thirds to a half of what you'd have at a meal. If you're talking about a snack, 15 grams of carbohydrate is probably a good guide for snacks for, for a lot of people, and this is a little high then for a snack. So just looking at the labels, don't spend your whole day in the grocery store. Just look at a couple of things and start to get familiar with them is, is what I'd recommend here. We talked a little bit about calorie needs, and... Um, I just wanted to mention that another service that the Mercy Fitness Center offers is a metabolic assessment. And what they'll do is in two short sessions, they can decide how many calories you should eat, um, what's the most beneficial exercise you might get out of your day. And that's an option for those of you that really want more um, information on calorie needs specific to you. I'm going to talk about something called 12 Habits of Successful Weight Loss. Um, and this is something that they came up with in a group called the National Weight Control Registry. And this is a group of over 5,000 people who have lost at least 30 pounds and kept it off for at least a year. That's quite an accomplishment if you know how many people struggle with losing weight and gaining it back. The actual average weight loss for these people is about 70 pounds over three to five years. They've kept that off. This is a large group of successful weight loss maintainers, and we can learn something from them. What they found out is that all these people did find different ways that worked for them to lose weight, but they kept off the weight using some similar type things. And one of the things that they all did is they ate a low-fat diet. That means eating healthy carbs, like we talked about earlier, um, whole grains, beans, fruits, and vegetables, and probably about a fourth of their calories were from fat. So they didn't eat a fat-free diet. They didn't, they were, everything was kind of balanced in their diet. But decreasing fat is just a really good way to lose weight because fat has so many calories compared to carbohydrates and protein. And then the second thing they did, about 90% of the people ate breakfast. This is important. If you don't eat breakfast now, that might be something you want to consider starting. Um, what breakfast start does is it, is it jump starts your metabolism. And if you fast for too long where you're not eating breakfast, then you're not really producing enzymes that are needed to take care of fat and to get you started on, on losing weight. You want to start those calorie-burning um, enzymes working right away in the morning. And then what happens when people also skip breakfast is by lunch and dinner they're starved, they tend to overeat. Um, breakfast skippers really tend to replace calories during the day just by either binging at lunch and dinner or by nibbling throughout the day because they simply get hungry and it's just a big setup for failure for people. You want to try to do about five small meals a day if you think you can work that into your day. Um, what I would say there is, you know, this is what the people in the National Weight Control Registry did, but you could probably get by with three meals. It depends on the person. Less than three meals, I, I don't recommend really for anybody um, because feeding the body regularly sends signals that the body doesn't have to store calories. So eating those three meals is, is super important, and you're going to have to kind of decide what works best in your routine. The big thing is three meals a day at least, and then making sure that the calories that come in are even with the calories going out if you want, want to maintain your weight or, or calories need to be less coming in than the calories going out if you want to lose weight. More often than not, um, the people in the weight control registry weighed themselves about once a week rather than every day. And what happens if you, lose, if you weigh yourself every day is you really don't see what the overall trend is and you kind of end up getting upset about a one or two pound weight gain or loss that really doesn't mean anything. So once a week is plenty. And the goal that you want to do for weight loss would be, if your goal is to lose weight, maybe one to two pounds per week is a good goal. And then exercise. Um, these people exercise about 60 minutes a day on the average. And I know that sounds like a lot. You know, probably starting with 30 minutes would be good and moving up from there depending on where you're at right now. Um, and a lot of the people, about a third of them, also lifted weights to increase that calorie-burning muscle mass. So start small and, and work up from there. And then not restricting foods too much. Um, they didn't completely take away all their favorite foods. When you force yourself to give up certain foods, you can, it can lead to binging, um, give you guilty feelings, and, and just 
kind of goof up your eating habits overall. So let yourself have a treat now and then. They decrease sugar and increase fiber. And what this does is it helps you feel full on fewer calories. Fiber is called the dieter's best friend. Um, but what you want to remember with fiber is you want to increase it slowly because otherwise you might, might not be a friend of those around you. They might want you out of that room. And then also drink lots of water when you increase fiber because that's going to help just your body handle that fiber better. Number eight is um, really staying away from gimmicks. Fad diets aren't a good thing. And actually there's a consumer report survey that found that about 80% of the people who kept off weight did it without fad diets and gimmicks. What did they do? They just ate a better diet. Sometimes that is easier said than done, though, isn't it? And then another thing is just changing the lifestyle. If you go on the National Weight Control Registry website, you find that there's some um, stories of people that they found certain things that worked for them. What worked for one didn't always work for the next. And so um, they changed their lifestyle. And it makes sense. Um, if you change your habits, you've got to kind of change it all the time to keep off those pounds for good. There's a lot of really good resources on the Internet, um, such as food journals, message boards, videos. And we'll talk about some of those resources here coming up at the end of, end of our discussion. The people recovered from relapses quickly. We have a major um, opportunity for relapse coming up called Thanksgiving this next Thursday. And you know, what you want to do there is you know, you're probably not going to eat like you would other days. So simply just go back to eating the way you did before. Um, and, and remember that a little extra exercise or a walk can be helpful that day. But go back to your, your old plan that you had before right away. Number 12 is probably the most important one on here. It turns out that these people kept food journals, and writing down what you eat is the number one predictor of weight loss success. It helps you learn your eating habits and identify bad eating habits, because you can look back and see where maybe things changed that those extra pounds started coming back on. The basic thing here then is you want to make a commitment to gradually adopt healthier eating habits for the rest of your life, and you have to find out what's going to work for you. Now there's a lot of resources where we can learn a little bit more about prediabetes and just about healthy eating in general. And our center offers a prediabetes class, and that's actually offered on Wednesdays from 2.30 to 4.30. It's the second and fourth Wednesdays. And if you'd like more information on that, um, you can call 398-6711. And we actually just charge $25 for that group class. Um, since a lot of times, unfortunately, the prediabetes isn't covered under a lot of people's insurance policies. Um, the next websites down here are um, the, eat right, the diabetes.org, which is the general diabetes website, has lots of information on all types of diabetes. And then the um, eatright.org is a website that offers a lot of videos on decreasing salt, some good breakfast tips general things about diabetes and men's health, so there's a lot of variety on there. Sparkpeople.com is kind of an interesting one. It's a message board where you can um, get ideas from other people and ask questions about weight loss and, and healthy, just overall healthy weight maintenance. The CalorieControl.org has a healthy weight toolkit that's pretty neat. And one of my favorites is probably um, the MyPyramid.gov in terms of healthy eating um, ideas because it has so many things, a food diary, weight loss information. Um, healthy menus and different kinds of audios that you can download to your iPod. So lots of things on there. And then the mercycare.org Joslyn website has resources offered by Mercy and also our Joslyn um, group in Boston. So you can get onto a lot of the good Joslyn information through that website. And then um, I think that kind of wraps up my part of the talk. So. Well, thank you, uh, Jane and Denise. Great information. As a gift to everyone who tuned in live today, we have a free copy of Eat This, Not That. It's a great little book listing and comparing foods by brand name. To pick up your copy, stop by the Jocelyn Diabetes Center Monday through Friday between 7.30 a.m. and 5 o'clock p.m. Uh, the center is located in the Mercy Health Plaza, 5264 Council Street Northeast on the north side of the building next to the Werenberg Theater. We'd ask you to pick up your book by the end of November. Now to remind you, your questions can be submitted from the box in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. 
So uh, let's begin with our first question. Okay, the uh, first question is talking about uh, the blurry vision symptom. How obvious is that system? And is there anything unique about it? Usually people with very high blood sugars um, can experience blurred vision. It's really a scary thing when you're first diagnosed and your vision is blurred because you think that you've already lost your eyesight like Uncle Charlie did. Blurred vision from high blood sugars is really the swelling of the lens of the eye in the front of the eye. That swelling of the lens will go down when blood sugars go down. Um, it's an osmotic thing that the, the high blood sugar pulls fluid into that lens. So once your blood sugars are back down to normal, the swelling will go away and the blurred vision should improve. Now sometimes what happens is you don't know that you have high blood sugars and you have the swelling of the lens going on, so you have glasses to fit that swollen lens. So when the swelling goes down, it changes your prescription for glasses and vision can actually get worse when you don't have a correct um, prescription. So we recommend for people that if they're um, first newly diagnosed with high blood sugars, that you have four to six weeks of really well-controlled glucoses before you get a new glasses for your prescription. But that is different than long-term damage to the back of the eye from uncontrolled diabetes. Next question. I love yogurt, but non-fat means non-flavor. Is there, or excuse me, is low-fat dairy still a healthy choice? Yeah, good question. I, the low-fat is still a good choice. You probably want to look at the yogurts, and if you're going to get one that's low-fat rather than fat-free, get one that has three grams of fat or less per serving. Another option that's kind of new with the yogurts that you might try if you haven't already is the Greek-type yogurts, the Greek-style yogurts because they're non-fat, but they have a little bit more protein, so they feel, it feels like you're eating a little, something a little bit richer when you're eating those Greek yogurts. But definitely um, with the yogurts, try to go three grams of fat or less. And then, you know, the low-fat dairy, when you're talking about milk, if you like milk, 1% um, milk is still a really good option. 1% and skim are both really good options for milk. Okay, another question I have. I recently lost 40 pounds over eight month period of time and am now within 30 pounds of my goal weight but was surprised to see my FBS was 110, higher than last year when I was heavier. Why would that be? I had fasted 12 hours. Well, first of all, congratulations on your weight loss because that is amazing. Most of us who struggle with weight loss realize that that is a very difficult thing to do. So good job. Um, it's really, really frustrating then when you've lost weight, you're exercising, you're doing the right things, and you still have high blood sugars, or now you have high blood sugars that you didn't before. Remember that the production of insulin um, can be a gradual decline. So it may be that last year you were still making more insulin and blood sugars were fairly normal, and now you're making less. When you lose weight, you're really impacting the second defect of diabetes, and that's insulin resistance. You're really not changing the defect of insulin production. So continue to work on your weight and exercise, and hopefully those blood sugars will come back into normal, uh, but be sure that you're watching it carefully over the next year or two. Okay. The question, carbs, calories, and now new valve from hy V. What numbers should I really be looking at? With the Nuvel system, um, now, the, you know, looking at the carbs and calories and all those things, it can be overwhelming, like we talked about when I was um, showing you the slide on that food label. The Nuvel system is something that's offered by the hy V stores, and I, I, as far as I know, it's not in any of the other grocery stores. I wish it, is it, yeah, it will be in, in the other grocery stores coming up. And what it is, it's a rating system from 1 to 100 that rates a food for healthfulness. So the closer you are to 100, the healthier that food is, and the closer you are to 1, the less healthy the food is. And the way to use this system is you don't have to look at the nutrition label as much then. You can just look at the number that's on the shelf below that food. And let's say you have different kinds of bread, and you're trying to decide which one is the best. And maybe one bread is rated a 60, one a 70, and one an 80. 
then you would know that one that has the 80, even though all three breads look the same when you're looking at the package, that one would be better. Um, probably has more fiber, more vitamins, less fat, that type of thing. So the new valve system really looks at all parts of the food and overall gives it a rating based on all those kind of confusing um, things that, that can be compared in foods. And just to note, uh, Walmart and Target in particular will have new valve coming soon. Okay, another question. Is there anything that can be done to specifically increase insulin production if that is the problem rather than insulin resistance? And that's a million dollar question actually. Um, we don't really have anything that you can do on your own that will increase insulin production other than taking certain medications. So really the part that's in your power is insulin resistance because that's very much impacted by weight loss and um, exercise. So insulin production is pretty much out of our power at this point. We just need to know more about it. This has been great information on presenting prediabetes, but I have type 2 diabetes. Is this reversible? That's another really good question, and, and you're going to hear some conflicting information about that. Some scientists will claim and they'll talk to you that if you lose weight and you exercise, you can actually get rid of your type 2 diabetes. Other scientists are saying, well, wait a minute, you can improve what your blood sugars look like, but did you really get a cure? And it's probably semantics. So it goes back to the, the last question. With weight loss and exercise, you can greatly decrease insulin resistance, but are you really changing insulin production? That's the question. So it kind of depends on who you're talking about. The thing that we all agree on, however, is that type 2 diabetes can be and should be controlled. So if you need more help with that, give us a call at J Joslin Diabetes Center, and we'd be glad to um, help you figure out how to control your type 2 diabetes. Okay, another question came in. My husband has more risk factors than me. What resources might I use to help educate him on nutrition and prediabetes? Actually, a lot of the resources that I showed you on, on the slides here would be really good resources to use. Uh, you know, you may not get him to get on those, those sites, but maybe you could, could get some ideas and, and then help support him in those. Anything you do to, you know, change your, the things you're doing at home, just the, the meals that you prepare, regular meal times, um, going for a walk after meals, I mean, all those things can really help him just being a support person. I think it's important to realize that the, web, uh, uh, the websites and the resources that we've listed here are not the only good sources, but you need to be careful where you get your information because not everything you read on the Internet is probably accurate. So just be careful where you get your information. Very good. I think you may have answered that next question was, what other resources does Jocelyn offer? Is there anything additional that you haven't mentioned? We actually offer classes for all aspects of people with diabetes. Um, you know, any, at any stage, any age, um, we work with children, adults, people who have had diabetes for 10 years, and, and people who are newly diagnosed. So. We offer lots of resources there, and then, of course, the pre-diabetes class. I believe we may have covered all the questions submitted, but if you have additional ones, um, we have a couple minutes to, to submit them. Uh, also, if you have additional questions, please call um, Mercy's Johnson Diabetes Center. Again, the number is 319-398-6711. A tape of this program will be available at www.mercycare.org forward slash live, and you can check this website for information about future webinars. Okay, our um, next webinar will be Tuesday, December 7th at noon. The topic will be dealing with grief during the holidays, and Barbara Cook, Hospice Bereavement Coordinator, and Kim Vogel, Hospice Chaplain, We'll take your questions live after their presentation. Uh, we had one last question. I believe there was an additional resource at Joslyn that you wanted to talk about. 
Yeah, one great resource that we offer for free at, at the Joslin Diabetes Center is the Diabetes Support Group. And that's the second Tuesday of every month, and it's free. And we bring in usually a speaker or have uh, um, special things going on each month, and it's a really nice group of probably 25, 30 people that get together every month. And that's the, the support group that is offered at the Joslin Diabetes Center. And you can call our number for more information. Again, um, that number, if you um, think of a question after we um, tune out today, uh, the number at the Johnson Center is 398-6711.